Unfortunately, martial arts are like money. They amplify your character. If you've got more money and you're a bad person, you're just more powerful bad person. What's happening, everybody? Thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 758, with today's guest, Sensei Les Bubka. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show and the founder of Whistlekick, which I founded because I love traditional martial arts and traditional martial artists probably like you. If you want to see all the things that we're doing to support your martial arts lifestyle, go to whistlekick.com. It's our digital hub. It's the center point for all the things that we're working on. And one of the things we've got there, yep, it's a store. Yep, we sell stuff. Yep, we've got to do it because we give you a free podcast, so we got to do some things to cover the pills. And if you're going to use the code PODCAST15, it rewards you, the loyal listeners, saves you 15% on the stuff that we've got over there. Martial Arts Radio is too big to contain in Whistlekick.com, so we gave it its own website, WhistlekickMartialArtsRadio.com. The show comes out twice a week, and the goal of the show, and really of Whistlekick overall, it's under the heading of connecting, educating, and entertaining traditional martial artists throughout the world. And if you want to support that work, there's so many things you could do. You could make a purchase, you could share an episode, or join our Patreon. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick is a place to go for that. You can support us monthly with as little as $2. And it goes up from there. We've got everything from free books, free masterminds, free sweatshirts and t-shirts and stickers. And there's just, there's so much there that you will rarely find people leaving the Patreon. It's all about value. Everything we do is about delivering overwhelming value, and Patreon is a great example of that. Now, if you want to go further, if you're already part of the Patreon, and by the way, thank you to all of you Patreon contributors, you can check out the family page, whistlekick.com slash family. I update that weekly, and it's got a, just a bunch of interesting stuff. It's all the things you can do to help, but it's also other stuff to, again, deliver value. My conversation with Les today is about martial arts, but it's also about life. It's about health. And it's about a personal journey of his that I relate to, and I suspect many of you also will relate. Instead of me telling you what you're about to hear, I'd rather just let you listen. Here we go. Les, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on, for your willingness to do this. Uh, been looking forward to talking to you. The the you know audience, uh, a lot of, a lot of you know that you know we ask the guests to fill out a form, which helps guide you know just kind of my my pre show thoughts. And uh, there's a subject that I know we're going to get into that's kind of close to my heart, both personally uh, for my own purposes and because of some friends. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting there. And and uh, if you think I, that I'm going to leave the foreshadowing there and not tell you what we're going to talk about, you're absolutely right, because that's what I do. And it drives some people nuts, and it, I, I find it enjoyable. So, awesome. yeah. Thanks. Um, we tend to start in a pretty predictable way, and I think that that's okay. And that way is your beginning. So if we were to imagine the beginning of a TV show or a movie about your time as a martial artist, what would those opening scenes look like? Uh, full of stress. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, fear. Mm. And um, learning about myself and um, persevering, learning to overcome the problems and um, enjoying it. Wow. Why did you start training? Uh, there's a kind of, I started training twice. Okay. So when I was 14, I, uh, 14, no, much less, about 10 years old, um, we all joined in a karate club in our school, which was the Oyama Karate uh, by Shigeru Oyama, but with the Polish instructors. Um, I think I enjoyed it. I don't remember much of it. I don't remember that, that much from my uh, childhood, which is going to be making more mm. sense later, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I had a, a shoulder injury, uh, kind of um, stopped training, and then had a long, long, long break. And then when I was 17, my friend dragged me to the another dojo, uh, as well offshoot of Kyokushin, and, um, and I stayed. So it was kind of enforced on me because I didn't want to do it and I didn't want to go anywhere. Mm. 
you didn't want to do it at 17 or at 10? At, at 17, yeah, yeah. I, I suffered with a huge anxiety. So actually okay. going going out and interact with people um, doing groceries, shopping and stuff like that was a huge wow. um, struggle for me. And one of my friends said, why well, you have to do something. Let's let's go and have a look. And I said, you know, yes, okay, okay. As uh, kind of getting rid of him. Yeah, 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 yeah we do it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Someday. Someday in, someday in the future, right? Uh, but now, Monday, he came in, knocked on my door, said, ah, yeah, you said you promised. And I always kept my promises. So, okay, let's uh-huh. go. And, and we went there and uh, I never left. Okay. So, um, you're opening the door to this part of the conversation. So, you had some significant anxiety. I, over the last couple of years, because of the <clears throat> openness of some guests on the show, have shared a a bit that i also deal with some anxiety we've had a number of guests who have talked about their anxiety it sounds like what you're talking about the way you're kind of describing how it was for you at 17 was rather extreme severe Uh, yeah i would uh, i learned about it later on when i started working with uh with the mental health charity because i thought it's uh it's quite normal that everybody is like that and 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 stuff but um it was kind of building on from very early childhood so i can't remember that stage of uh 10 years 12 years mm-hmm. earlier so that's uh, partly to the polish um culture at that time so we've been under communism so all the trade was done via alcohol. Mm-hmm. So my dad was drinking since he was 14. So he was an alcoholic and he passed away because of alcoholic or alcoholism. Mm-hmm. And um, then he maybe passed from his parents and stuff like that. He wasn't very a uh, caring person. Mm-hmm. Um, he was not the kind of, kind of person that, you know, he says good things behind your back, but never in your face. So we never heard with my brother that, you know, you're, you're good, you're, um, you're doing great. It was always pointing out bad things. And I think that's when it started. Then um, we've been robbed. So uh, I let the robber into the house because he convinced me that he's a friend of my dad. Mm. So that's kind of deteriorated um, my relation with my dad. And it kind of sparked out that I didn't want to be in school. I was avoiding school as much as I can. I was forging my my parents' uh, signatures that I was off sick and stuff like that. And kind of didn't want to be with friends um plus at 16 years old i uh, uh they don't really know why i lost half of my teeth and they couldn't fit it, the dentures in uh, in because i was still growing my jaw was growing mm. so you know imagine by 16 years old you try to chat up girls and stuff like that by you missing sure. from teeth so it was i think you know uh, it, it was just um difficult for my brain to process and i always been uh, kind of um very low on self esteem so that's the reasons why I didn't want to go. It's a <laughs> lot. New people, girls and stuff. Yeah. And then, and, but I'm glad that my friend convinced me and uh, and then doing karate, it changed my view. And I learned that uh, people really don't care. Right. Everybody is a star in their own movie and, and everybody else is the background, second category actors and their people right. don't care. Let's talk about those early days for you in that, that second step into martial arts for a couple reasons. One, I, I want to hear more of your story, but also there are plenty of people listening to this episode <clears throat> who have not experienced anxiety, but maybe they teach. And for them to have a better understanding of what it's like for someone on their first day, I say this all the time, Go whether whatever your personal story is, the first day of martial arts training, stepping into a new school, even if you've been training 30 years, is scary. Mm-hmm. You don't know what you've got. You don't know who you're going to train with. You don't fully understand what's happening here. And the more compassionate the instructor can be in welcoming you, the easier time it is for everyone. So you talked about your friend, you know, doing all but twisting your arm, it sounds like, to get you to go. <laughs> yeah. Shows up on Monday, says, get in the car or however you're getting there, get on the bus and you're going. Do you remember what it felt like as you traveled from your home to this dojo? It was like uh, I had a sinking hole in my stomach and it tried to pull me and I was looking for opportunities that something happened that I can uh, twist my way out of it. Mm. So, you know, all the thoughts, oh, I can say I'm not very well. Oh, I've got a cough or what, I do something. Maybe I fell over, break my nose. 
So it was, um, you know, it was kind of a race, but in a way, I wanted to be part of the group. I wanted to be accepted. So it was like an internal battle mm-hmm. of, yeah, let's do it. And and I promised, right? The promises was and is still very important for me. If I promise something, I'm trying to uh, to do it. Um, so we went, but that walk up the steps, we actually walked because like 200 meters away from my house was a, a call, something called House, house of Culture. Mm-hmm. So I had a small cinema and different groups and there was a martial arts in their karate. Um, so we walk in there and, you know, you're walking up the steps and you can see people gathering and immediately you think that you're in a spotlight. Mm-hmm. So everybody was wa- watching me, right? Every time when they laughed, they must have been laughing at me. Mm-hmm. There's no other way because I'm a center of attention. That's kind of what I think an anxiety does to some people, at least then to me, mm-hmm. that if you feel that you are on the spotlight and everybody's talking about you, so you kind of center of attention, but the negative way, so it spins mm-hmm. it that, you know, oh, they must be laughing at me because I don't have teeth. And I walk funny. I'm a very small guy. So that was that, you know, and, and all training, you know, you're just watching the first training, you don't know what's going on. There's a huge people, there are black belts, they, you know, it's, it was contact karate, so seven, uh, eight, uh, 90, so everybody's going full contact. Mm-hmm. And it's just a scary place to be. But um, the physical activity always was uh, escape for me, so I started doing gym a bit earlier, and we done the old-fashioned warm up that you have to survive the 45 minutes of warm up push ups and stuff like that so really hardcore but that completely took my mind away so it was kind of like a safe haven mm. in that physical um workout so i i found there that i can escape at least for that 45 minutes and then get my beatings and that's kind of taking <laughs> taking your mind mind away from everything else what's going on you know school parents whatever so um for me it was like a, a safe house i'm sure day one there were times where you said i like this but probably not enough that without me i'm, I'm guessing that your friend had to continue to prompt you for a little while to go oh yeah 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 do so, you remember when that changed, when he no longer needed to drag you to karate? I do remember because I thought I'm going to die just a couple of days before. Mm-hmm. And so my, we had a, a, a display. And one of my teachers said, you know, oh, you're going to help us with the display. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not doing it. But that was in my head. I said, yes, okay. I do it. So they, we went for a display and I had a small role of the a kata uh, being taught, uh, so a few movements. And, and, and when we done that, I went on the stage panicking, you know, everybody's going to notice my mistakes. But when I started doing kata, I had the, like a tunnel vision. Suddenly everybody disappeared. You know, you know how it is, you're in a competition and stuff like that. You worry, but you step in and then everything blurs and just it's you. And I done a few mistakes. I thought, you know, oh, I'm so rubbish and stuff like that. But my friend said, nobody noticed. My sensei said, nobody noticed. You know, look, yeah. you done perfectly. Everybody is clapping. And I thought, I like the guy. He's supportive. The whole team was behind me. Nobody was pointing my mistakes, laughing. And I thought, yes, I actually want to be here mm-hmm. because I've got that support, you know. Mm-hmm. That support that maybe you would have benefited from having earlier. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Okay. What next? You know, you're, you're, you're starting to find your way. It's no longer something that you have to be told to do or encouraged to do. You're <clears> encouraging <throat> yourself. And obviously you kept going. What did that look like? Uh, total obsession. Nothing else matters. School oh. doesn't matter. Uh, none other activities. I'm 100% in training five days a week, eight hours a day. At least eight hours head. a day in my head. Uh, yeah, well, no, I get yeah, I... sitting sitting in school reading okay. a book instead of reading a book. I see the movements and mm-hmm. you know, and fighting going on. Um, all the karate books I can could get hand, hands on DVDs, videos at the time. Um, totally submerged becoming a uchideshi for my teacher. I don't mm. think so he wanted, but I was pastoring him because he was living not far from <laughs> me. So 
constantly calling him with questions and stuff like that. It was a total obsession with karate, which I'm not sure if it was that um, beneficial. Probably I could do better in life if I, if I pay attention in school and don't fail everything. But, you know, that was my escape, and that's what made me happy. Mm -hmm. um, so, in a way, I, I don't regret it because um, I... I think I'm good in karate, and now I am doing the. I'm doing. Okay, you've been eating good in dinner. That's great. <laughs> Sorry, my son just came. It's okay. Go on. That's great. Can I get please, yes. Go on. Go away. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, where was? Um, so Which I could does. do better. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I could do. I could do better if I um, focus on education instead of doing martial arts. But then probably I wouldn't write the book. Uh, about my story because I would be doing something else completely and probably I wouldn't have been in UK I'll be still in mm. Poland um, because of lack, lack of options in Poland um, I came to UK um, started working here started my school uh, started my business started working with the people with mental health and you know it just rolls right yeah. it was a long process but I made um that I can do what I love as my job. Mm. We've had many authors on the show. I've written a few books myself. For me, the most interesting part about any book is the time leading up to before writing it. Mm. Whatever it is that brings your idea about so strongly that you have to do it. Because anybody who's written a book knows it is a, a <clears throat> difficult experience. It takes forever and almost no books pay off. Very, very few books does the, does the author look at and say, that was worth my time economically, mm. financially, right? Like yeah. it, it takes so much time. What was the story leading up to you writing your book? Your so first we, book? Um, we uh, decided that um, I'm gonna have expanded family. So uh, first child on the way. And I was thinking, what mistakes uh, my dad made um, so I don't want to do it. So I started writing notes. And a few of my friends read it, and then they said, well, why don't you just write a book? And, um, you know, I was writing what helped me and sports, so we decided that uh, our children will have to do a lot of sports because you could support community and stuff like that. And then, then slowly it started becoming, like, you know, memoir. And the people said, well, it's really good. We're going to help you edit it because my English isn't, especially mm -hmm. written English, is not, not the best. Well, my wife is English and uh, uh, she can correct stuff. But um, yeah, a few people helped. And it was mainly for me to see what was wrong with my life so I don't make the same mistakes for my son. Mm -hmm. um, and from that, went in. And, you know, I'm really surprised how many people uh, have a similar uh, experiences and how many people, you know, uh, found it helpful and contacted me after that saying, you know, Thank you for writing this. And it's a very honest um, book about martial arts. And, and you know, people love mm. it. So now of course you you started writing the book for before it was even a book for yourself, mm -hmm. and other people found value in it. What did writing the book do for you? It gave me a I think catharsis, I can't pronounce it, like a clean, you know, self-enlightenment um, or mm. catharsis. 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 Catharsis, yeah, sorry for my pronunciation. That's okay. Um, so, you know, before publishing the book, I had it already. Uh, we had a test print, it was great, but I was very hesitant to publish it because mm -hmm. it's very, very private, you know, I'm going full on mm -hmm. opening about every single thing I remember. Um, so it's kind of, should I really say that to people? Um, do they want to know? Everybody's going to hate it. You know, everybody thinks I'm a loser. And, you know, again, you think that, that an anxiety, you, you fought with it, you won it, but it takes you by surprise, right? It starts creeping in that negative thought in there. And, and, but I thought the one thing which karate learn, teach me is take challenges um, phase on, right? So I have to do it. Nobody's going to like it. Nobody's going to know about it, right? Amazon is great. If you're not successful, nobody knows. Um, so, so I forced myself to, to publish it. And um, 
from the group of martial artists, actually a lot of people bought it and mm. had a fantastic review saying, you know, well done, it's brave, um, brave for you to go in so open about your experiences. And, you know, many people said they've got the similar stories. And, you know, so I was overwhelmed with the acceptance and it like the stone drop of my heart, you know, mm -hmm. everybody knows now, so I don't have to hide anything. I can be myself. Which... There's something I'm finding really interesting about that <clears throat> response to writing this book versus the way you felt at 17 going to the dojo the first time, this fear that everyone's watching you and they're going to criticize you. They're going to laugh at you versus after the book, everyone is watching you, but they are relating to you and they're thankful that you were willing to be watched. Yeah. It, it, there's something beautiful in that for me. I, I think I think this is the benefit of um, karate and that's what I'm basing all my programs on it. Because if you look on karate and the grades, you are um, have a control failure. So you're going for the grades, you're coming to the dojo, you know nothing. And you're going to be failing in whatever you're doing mm -hmm. until you don't know master it. And then the um, stages you're going through. So you've got a yellow belt, green belt, brown belt, black belt. That's for our style. And then you can look retrospectively and say, wow, I've overcome so many obstacles. And I think that a habit of overcoming things is translating as well to your private life. You start thinking about yourself, oh, this is the failure, it's end of. You start thinking, this is just the, another obstacle that I need to overcome. Mm -hmm. So my decision within martial art was to head on collision. So if something is uh, tough for me, I just go and do it. And by repetition, it gets easier and easier and easier. And I decided the same thing with the book, right? If I don't do it, I won't know, I won't overcome it. It's always going to be bugging me. Mm. So I think the karate built me up to just have that challenge and try despite I'm afraid of it. Yeah. When you, when you think about your relationship to martial arts now, it's a little bit different, isn't it? It started, it was something that you, you wanted distance from. Then you wanted as little distance as possible. But it, it sounds now like it is a... I'm going to use the word healthy, but I don't think it's the best word. What, what, I'm, what I'm hearing is early on, you, martial arts was something you looked up to, you aspired to. And now it's something that is uh, in partnership with you. Yeah, Just I the way you're I, talking about some of these things that you're doing, it, it, it is your support structure. Yeah, I think well, the balance would be the best thing. Mm, balance, sure. So, so as I was um, obsessed with martial arts, I learned that you know there are other things in life and you cannot... We all have a burn up, right? If I put 100 percent into the which i used to do you know mm. everything was uh under control of karate it's getting a bit unhealthy because you're losing other things in life that are um you know important like family and uh, friends and stuff like that you know um and you need that you need you need that variety you need to have a break from even the things you love right if you if you're constantly doing karate karate your progression is not um uh, constant we all know that we're going ups and downs so it's like sinusoid sinusoidal um so i fit in make sure that i fit the uh, breaks from karate and i do other stuff so recently i started in banzai's but you know mm. having two kids there's not so much time on martial arts so i have to find the the less but more quality i would mm -hmm. say so yeah i think I think you're right. I bounce off a bit, you know, and, and found the balance of um, having happy family life and a happy training time. Right. Now, you mentioned, and, and, and I know from, from your notes, that you, this, this exploration of martial arts and anxiety, mental health, is something you're very passionate about and something you are working on. Could you talk about that? So I work with a um, few organizations plus our council, um, local council um, providing um, sessions for people with uh, severe mental health, disability, 
and elderly. So there are three, three programs <clears throat> running. And uh, it funny started all by, uh, I didn't want, didn't meant to work with people with mental health. I went uh, to work with people with alcoholism. Mm. I thought, you know, my dad was suffering with that. I don't drink. Uh, so maybe I can help um, some kids getting their dads, moms of the alcohol and being addicted to martial arts, mm. let's say. Uh, <clears throat> but I went to the charity and they said, sorry, we don't have anything like that. But there is a mental health charity. Maybe they want it. So I went there. They really wanted it. The guys tried it. That was eight years ago. And we've got a running group from there. Uh, you know, started with three people. Now it's 14 people. That's great. Um, but it's kind of a close group. Um, mm -hmm. So it's only for the clients. So you have to be referred to the organization and they refer mm -hmm. you to, to our class. But people are loving it. Um, yeah, last they say, there is nothing more stress releasing than smashing the pads. That's <laughs> true. So, you know, there's something magical in it when you can yeah. actually hit something really hard and, and let that stress out. Um, plus, we've got people with um, different range of disabilities from deafness to MS, um, anger issues, menopausal and stuff like that. So we have full in inclusive club. So everybody's welcome. Mm. Plus, we're doing our uh, not so young club where we use uh, karate as a meditation vehicle and relaxation. So something like Tai Chi, mm. um, but we're using the karate katas. That's great. The when you're teaching folks from a mental health perspective, folks who have been referred in for some mental health challenge, what do you do differently versus say a uh, um, Let's call it a, a normal, a standard class that someone might be used to. So it, it is very um, personal in a way um, because not everybody's got the same issues, right? So you have to all the time checking what we can do. Uh, so I don't do anything contact-wise except pads uh, just because some people can't stand touch. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some movements are too dangerous um, because they don't have so much focus at least my group doesn't have so much focus and um the little things can set them out that they have to go out and, and have a break right and you never know what that what that is some people suffer with uh, anxiety like me some people have a depression some have a schizophrenia and you just don't know uh, mm. so it's all kind of on the feel and on a day so if i see that uh, people who i know are overwhelmed by some activity i immediately changing it so our standard is a warm-up a shadow boxing or a techniques combinations mm -hmm. uh pad work and kata uh, so that's our standard uh, and with that we we kind of try to, to find different ways to entertain people like everybody likes to laugh so i put a lot of humor um and mainly taking mickey out of myself um, so there is no um, kind of um, possibility that I'm going to be laughing at somebody else. It's always, you know, me doing a mistake, me having mm -hmm. doing something and stuff like that. So, uh, and as well, we're doing completely non-judgmental. So I don't um, judge people. I think the, the, <laughs> the most difficult part was on the few first session um, to deal with conversation because you're coming in and we are conditioned. If somebody asks you, how are you? Oh, very well. It's all great. And, you know, I was that, that kind of guy, right? Everything is always all right. And you're coming in. and Even if it both. isn't. Yeah, exactly. And the, the guys told me that they are open about their problems. So I'm going in there happy as Larry saying, oh, how was your day? Oh, it was very bad. I don't feel great. I'm suicidal today. And you go kind of stop in the tracks. Uh, and where do I go now? What do I say? I can't say all gonna be great because it might not be. Um, so it took me a long time to just uh, shut my mouth, mouth and listen, right? They don't need me telling anything back. Right. You just listen. So I'm kind of trying to kind of listen, observe, observe people and try to figure out and nav navigate the best way. But other thing that I learned that works the best for my classes is to simply ask. You know, they don't have a problem with telling you um, what's the problem. And so I was asking, okay, what we can do today is 
15 minutes on the pads okay with everybody? And some people say yes, other people say no, that's too much. So we organize, you know, this one gonna be doing pad work, let's do the kata here. So yeah. I pay your at attention how you're doing katas or or something else. Or just some people come sit down and just watch, right? Mm. So it's very, very individual and every session is kind of different needs. So so it takes quite a bit of um, brain power to figure out what we're gonna do today. It sounds it. But I can I can see there's there's a smile as you're talking about it in a way that you haven't been smiling the rest of our conversation. So am I am I correct that this is one of your favorite parts of your day? Yeah, it is. It is, and it's super rewarding. You know, I, as I say, I'm working with uh, people for seven years, some of them, and seeing that progression from a zero to a green belt now. Oh, you do uh, do rank. I do, I do, I do. Uh, some do because some of uh, uh, people from there decided to join my regular club. Mm. So on the mental health project, I don't do ranks okay. as such. If somebody wants to, we, in, in all my clubs, I do two ways. Either you go classical and you want to do all the hoops and loops of karate, or you just come and train. I don't have, you know, everybody wants to fit in and, and find sure. their own way. Um, but with mental health, um, because I never know when they're going to cancel it. The, the strange thing is that, for example, a big disappointment for me was during the lockdown mm. that they just simply pulled the plug out. And yeah. from de day one to day two, oh, sorry, you don't have classes. They come back to me after, but it is, you know, it's unpredictable. And um, actually, people never express, expressed um, they want a grade. So we don't have uh, geese and stuff like that. We just hmm. train and play, play and clothing just for enjoyment. Um, for all my classes, we, we really don't focus. The, the grade is the side outcome of training, if that makes sense. It does. But yeah, yeah, it is it is my favorite part of the day. And, and I like challenges and, you know, seeing those guys growing and some people coming back. You know, I cannot take the credit for it, but I hope it helps. Coming back and saying, wow, I've got a job. I was confident and stuff like that after five years of training and they mm. all saying that, you know, it is helping them. So it must be something in it. I wish <laughs> that um, I'm just hoping to have a connection with the university, which we're going to do a proper study on it. Mm. So actually have some evidence that it's helped because at the moment it's all anecdotal. It's actually now I'm just working on a, a, my new book where I'm going to be interviews with the people who train with me. Um, and trying to give evidence to how it helped them with um, given conditions, so there'll be different conditions and Ooh. how they perceive the benefits of karate. So still anecdotal, but with more research done into it. Right. Well, anecdotal maybe in a scientific community, but anyone I suspect who is working day in and day out with these folks, especially the ones that knew them before you started mm. teaching them karate, and now I'm sure they all can see the difference. <clears throat> Yeah, they, they speak freely about it. So um, that makes me even more happy, you know? Yeah. I've talked to folks who have run, let's call them uh, non-standard martial arts programs over the years. And what I've noticed is all of them take lessons. Of course, most of what you're teaching and how you're teaching starts in a conventional way and you bring it to this other population and adjust as needed. You talked about that. But I know it also goes back the other way. What are some of the things that have come from teaching these, these uh, what, what did you call it, the, the not so young and <laughs> those with mental health that you've incorporated or at least considered in a more conventional martial arts setting? Uh, inclusion. Mm. <laughs> inclusion more. and vulnerability. So um, I know how uh, stressful it is to go into the dojo. Mm. Especially for women, right? Because the, uh, that's the other thing we, we try to change, but it's male-dominated environment. Mm -hmm. So you're coming in and you've got lots of men and you know people create groups naturally. And when you're that new person, you don't know who to talk to, right? So I am always up front and um, welcoming and saying, you know, uh, don't, don't worry. You know, I know it's uh, stressful. I've been there. I done, I've got an anxiety. So people seeing me being allowed to be vulnerable, mm. they're getting com uh, confidence. And as well, I make sure and my guys are well trained in welcoming people. There is no such thing that people disperse. 
if the new person comes in, everybody goes and introduces themselves. I don't need to chase them. It naturally mm -hmm. happens because they're copying me, right? And we are um, non-judgmental, uh, at least. Uh, I cannot say for other people, I am non-judgmental. Yeah. But the culture in the club is that nobody's judging anybody, right? We all have a baggage. We all have a problems. And as well, uh, I think the biggest skill is the observation skills. Um, so I can pick up problems instantly. And funny enough, been teaching in... Uh, abroad with my good friend who doesn't have that skill and we've been talking and i said you know this this person got a problem there's argument between those two and uh, there's something going on there and he said man how do you see that i don't know i just learn observing people and see picking up the stress and distress and trying to go and kind of disperse it um via my aura my personality mm. and at the most times i'm successful it doesn't work all the time because sometimes people are so stressed that you just you, you can't win and um yeah but i think that's and the teaching style really focus on individual and, and inclusion right mm. um so we make sure that everybody's involved even if they cannot do it uh they are in some form involved and maybe i um describe a situation from our club so it's gonna be more clear what i mean yeah by please that. so we've got a friend who is uh <clears throat> deaf so during sparring, she cannot spar because she got a cognitive implant, so mm -hmm. no punches in the head. And she got a bad problem, so she didn't want to spar at all. So instead of sitting on the side and watching, we gave a timer plus camera. So she was our timer and uh, recording what we're doing. Mm. And she was over the moon. She said, I'm a part of it. I'm loving it. I can give you feedback. I tell you when to stop. If I want to cheat, I keep the clock longer. Awesome. <laughs> You're doing my stuff. So, you know, by that way, you don't have people not doing anything, just sitting on the side. They are involved. They don't have to do the same activity, but they are involved in their overall, overall activity. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of going out, go, coming out of, out of the box and finding the way that everybody can have a play. Yeah. You're, you're describing an environment that I'm becoming more and more aware where the line is for different schools. In, in one sense, you have kind of the old way of looking at it where the instructor is up here and everyone else is here and, and their role, they kind of have two roles to, to train themselves, you know, to learn, but also to serve the instructor, to serve the school. But what you're describing is much more balanced where you mm -hmm. recognize your role as the instructor you still have a role. It's not that everyone's serving you. It's that you're all serving each other. Yeah. So uh, I've, ne I've never been a fan of uh, militaristic style. I've got the issues with uh, following authorities anyway. So um, you're not alone. We all we, we are uh, more open-minded. You know, we don't use titles and stuff like that. I'm just less. Mm -hmm. And um, if somebody wants to call me sensei, oh, fine. You you their thing. But um, we are there to support each other, right? And if there is less stress, um, there is less problems and people learn faster. So my welcoming thing is that we've got a really, really strict rule. Only one. Don't get stressed. Mm. And people go, ah, okay. Because they, you build up that stress that they, oh, there's going to be rules. If very strict, don't get stressed. You can't do anything wrong. Mm. If you do something wrong, it's my job to correct and help you or one of the people right so so all students support each other not to go take it you know that everybody's an instructor but um and as, as well as well that's probably coming from poland because i've done wrestling in poland as well and been coaching it i don't like the word instructor anymore mm. because in poland the instructor just instructs and the coach is a higher educational stuff mm -hmm. so you're coaching people instead of just showing them the way so I rather describe myself as a coach. So I'm there to build them up instead of yeah. just show them what to do. If that makes sense? It does. It's actually, it's a term that, you know, you know, because you filled out the form. We ask you, what what title mm. do you use? And you said, well, you essentially, listeners, Les wrote down sensei. If, if, you, if you're going to use something, we can use sensei, but I'd rather you don't use anything. But in that box, over the years that we've been doing this, I see the word coach show up a lot more than it used mm. to. Yeah. Uh, in, in UK, it's strange because they are equal. And uh, 
generally for karate is used instructor. So when they mm -hmm. say I'm a coach, people are like, uh, but what does it mean? You're an instructor. No, I've got a coaching qualification, which mm. in Poland, instructor, maybe that way. I, I'm, I'm looking from a Polish perspective because I was sure. brought up there. In Poland, instructor, you're doing within three weekends. To be a coach, it is five years to be a third class coach, mm. and another two years to be two, a second, and then a first, and then one more year to be a first class coach. So it's about five years to be a coach wow. in university. I don't have that. But I have other coaching uh, qualifications, so I rather might teach myself uh, use the name coach for myself, which kind of seems to be rubbing people the wrong way in UK. Oh, interesting. See now, now here, I don't think we have quite as much uh, baggage with the word instructor, but I also don't think the word coach is is going to be met as. Uh, um, with as much difficulty unless you're in a very traditional martial arts circle mm. you know and and then you also i'm sure you're you're aware there are plenty of people who get really uh, um committed to certain titles for certain people yeah. certain rank right but I, I i do like the word coach for the exactly the reason you're using it that it, it is more than showing people how to do things an instructor is a more or less a one-way relationship. I'm going to mm -hmm. instruct you. If you don't get it, that's not part of my job. But if I'm your coach, if you're my coach, if we're not getting it, it is our job. It is part of our responsibility. And I suspect when we talk about it that way, most of the folks listening who run martial arts schools will think, well, yeah, it, it absolutely yeah. is my job to make sure what I do lands and is understood and for me to help them get their best experience possible. Exactly, exactly. We try to get them better than us. If I just instruct, I'm just passing what I know and I keep them under the bar. If I yeah. coach, I will go the extra mile to make them better. Sometimes it means that I have to send them to somebody else because it reached my limit, right? Mm -hmm. Which I think that's the issue as well in, in karate circles that everybody wants to be on top. And they're keeping people, and especially women, under the glass ceiling. Mm. They, you know, because uh, a woman will be higher grade than me. Well, I love it, you know. If people get better than me, that means I done my job properly. Right, right. More and more, I I think I see that attitude coming through. This idea that the best instructors, coaches, whatever term you want to apply, will create students who sort surpass them. Mm. Whereas when, when I was coming up, that idea was just, that was, nobody even talked about that. That was impossible. Mm. It was as if martial arts kept getting worse over time because they wouldn't yeah. quite reach the standard of the instructors. And I, I, I'd rather see it go the other way. I want to know that in 50 or 100 years, martial arts and martial artists are better than ever. Mm. Well, that's, that's the purpose of evolution, isn't it? To make us better. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I don't know why. It must be ego involved or it's something. It's ego. You know? because I, I was fortunate because my teacher always was very open. So I went to, to the dojo and uh, being very stressed. And he said, you know, if you want to go and check others, other um, schools, there's plenty of schools, choose the one which you prefer. Because I was with my friend. I stayed in that one. But... Mm. Um, Ever since then, we had always open seminars with different teachers. Go try this. That's why I end up in a, in a wrestling club mm. and become coaching in there, you know, through, learn through, with them and change my karate in a big way because of a um, wrestling coach. And, and that's where I kind of learned the difference between instructor and a coach. Mm. Uh, the, the way they've been taught in the wrestling class was way comprehensive so all around it um than in my karate school although my teacher was very good but he was lacking of that educational knowledge you know what mm. i mean because he was only on instructor's course he had an in-depth having had in-depth uh teaching methodology mm. and that's what i see in karate that this the, the methodology of teaching is a bit way behind to models combat sports, if that makes sense. 
Mm. Well, I just want to put the light on because I think I'm just sure. from the sure. <laughs> from, from the screen. Oh, well, I, I, I want to ask about something because I, I think I know something that some of the listeners may not know. And if they don't know, this might uh, hearing about this might clarify some things for them. I know in some countries, and I'm guessing Poland is one of them, in order to instruct or to coach certain things, you have to have some kind of certification that the government signs off on. That's like what that. you're talking about with that instructor yeah. course, that three yeah, weeks. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean that your instructor had three weeks of martial arts experience. No, 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 no. He's got about 50 years. Ago. Right. But right. then in, in Poland, if you want to open your own class, you need you used to need to be minimum fifth Q and do the uh, national course recognized by the governing body, which is one per system. Mm. So it was karate and it was a Shotokan branch and Kyokushin branch. Mm -hmm. But you had the uh, karate instructor. So that, that was about three weekends, yeah. and that gives you the basic. Uh, so it was two two parts. So the basic instructor and then specialized instructor for karate. Okay. So, but to be called to be coach, you need to have a five years of um, university. Wow. So where you learn um, how to teach. So you're basically becoming a a wrestling teacher or karate teacher. Um, so you've got that full education, right? Mm. Um, now it's changed. It it took the uh, UK style where you just put the black belt and off you go. And if you can grab insurance, you're okay to teach. Okay. Now you you hinted at some of the things <clears throat> you've learned as a wrestling coach that changed the way you looked at a karate class. You talked about it being more uh, more well rounded. That your instructor was a good instructor but he lacked some things can you talk more about that um so for, for me the, the the big change was that everything we learned it was put put in the practice on the end of the class mm -hmm. so you know although we had the sparrings and stuff like that in karate it was kind of coaching style so knockdown so no grappling just kicks and stuff um in wrestling whatever subject was there there was always a play fight plus sparring. Mm -hmm. So you didn't try to take your head off, your partner's head off without practice stuff. You're going through that mm -hmm. stage of play. And that's what I incorporate in my karate style. So we do applications for kata, whatever. And then we've got the play, play side where there's no ego involved. You didn't try to win. You just go through the motion with the working with your opponent, but not fully compliant, if that makes sense. So it's trying to understand that concept yeah. or that technique, that drill. Mm. Yeah. So so we took took that that on every session we do some form of sparring, and it brings results, right? Oh, uh, sure. The, the guys are getting better. It's it's like in the BJJ and, and stuff like that. The other thing was that you know you had a a mental coaching as well. So we introduced that later in our karate class, like visualization. Uh, you know, dealing with. Um, injuries and overcoming the injuries how your brain is involved in making your joints work better after injury and stuff like that so there's a lot of more mental work involved in it um, building up the students to be a confident individual instead of just saying kick like that do 10,000 kicks and it's gonna work for you right so so that kind of kind of this differences and uh, and you know and as well for me, I reversed the recently we reversed the uh, syllabus. Mm -hmm. So when I started, it was like a pyramid. So you got tons of techniques for a mm -hmm. white belt, and then you're specializing. So <clears throat> for us now, it's a diamond. So you're starting with a, a very small amount of techniques and easy ones, then build up to the more co uh, complicated and more. And then after black belt, you're narrowing. A specialization right so we've got 10 katas but uh from uh, second down so second black belt you choosing only three that you focus and specialize in it mm. and then I like that. Um, people working i will tell you if it works in about 10 years <laughs> because it's at the moment three years so well i i bet you know that it's working for the for the white belts yeah I, I'm sure that the difference between you, do you go white, yellow? 
or white green? Uh, we, we, we go white, yellow, okay. then green. I'm, I'm sure you can see a difference at a yellow belt test with less material for them to have to worry about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and this is something I have long thought this, and I'm starting to see more and more schools that are, are attacking this problem in different ways. But the idea that a white belt needs to know, you know, several forms and 30 different mm. techniques before yellow belt, I don't think it's coincidence that most people drop out before yellow belt. Yeah. We're overwhelming them. It's too much stuff. It doesn't it happen is. in any other hobby or sport. <clears throat> exactly. We so. give them a little bit so they can work on it and feel good. Like they actually know something. Mm, yeah. So we, we change as well. Um, so I do, I call it a, a kata based syllabus. Mm -hmm. So we don't do uh, all our kihon is take straight from kata. Mm. So on each grading, you've got a, a technique straight from kata. And we don't waste time on standing in kihon. When you do kata, you do your kihon. Mm -hmm. The rest is all with the partner. And I kind of teach the kata opposite way. So we do first applications and then go to kata. Mm -hmm. So which some people say that my student's kata or my kata is um, not very pretty because we don't care about aesthetics. We sure. work about the movement. So, you know, different ways, different flavors. And that's the other beauty of karate. You can make it whatever you want, isn't it? Right. Well, if if you made it really pretty, there'd be just as many people saying, well, does it look like that's very effective? Exactly. You can't make everyone happy. Nah, nah. And nor, nor should you. Nor should you try. Exactly. Okay. You, you talked about looking for this university, this second book and everything, but it sounds like you're... you're got some of that down that is that second book released or not yet no that, so that's my that's my fourth book uh, oh your fourth uh, book. okay all right so i'm <laughs> i i'm missing some things so we we've got to fill those gaps in then <laughs> so the first one was anxious black belt mm -hmm. uh then the second one was a thoughts on karate so i used to run a blog but uh, friends of mine said it's really complicated to find your articles making a book Mm -hmm. So you throw it in the book. Uh, the third one is the dark side of karate about all the things, big corporations and what's right. We're going to come back to that in a moment. What's going to, uh, what's um, all the bad things in, in, in karate. Uh, we've got the mental health journal where mm -hmm. you fill up um, your classes and you mark your mood mm -hmm. on before and after. And this is very popular with in UK. Yeah. And now it's going to be Karate for Mental Health. Um, it's I'm waiting for two more uh, interviews, and that should be done. It's going to be unusual because either it's going to catch on or people are going to hate it. Because could be I both. Decide, uh, could be both, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, what I've done is, because working with people with mental health is a specific thing, Mm -hmm. The way some of them talk is very specific and sometimes very difficult to follow. Mm -hmm. So I decided to not correct any grammar in conversation. Mm -hmm. To give a reader a feel how it is to talk with people with um, disability or learning difficulty or mental health. Mm -hmm. Because it's not so straightforward. Um, so it, either people are going to hate it because sometimes it's kind of, you have to go out and I'll come back and trace it. Or people are going to love it because it's, it's the real thing, right? It's not uh, watered down and make it pretty. It is as it is. So it's really our conversation put on the paper mm. as it was with all the grammar mistakes, mine and the other people. Too. Oh, I love it. I love it. I look <clears> forward to that. Let's go back to, I think it was your <laughs> third, the third book you mentioned, Dark yeah. Side of Karate. Yeah. That's a that's a bold title. Tell us, tell us it about is. that one. Um, so, uh, because I went, uh, sorry, something popped up. It's okay. So I went through different organizations. We had some disturbance in our club, and my teacher stopped um, teaching. Put us in the different schools. Uh, I'm not gonna say names. I don't okay. use names names in book either. So I described the process of what happens and the opening, if I remember properly, I'm going to try to quote some opening. So the, op the book starts with the master passing down, pass, uh, dying on the bed. His spirit goes, hovers over his body and see he 
these free students arguing between who's got the right lineage and who's going to be the successor. And then he, is, he gave him one to be a successor. He thought he was the best one, but hovering, he see how the guy was corrupt and uh, managed to manipulate him to get and how the, the honest student being taken advantage of. And from that, it's branching out to different styles of um, different anti-hero um, using different tactics to become a powerful dojo owner or instructor or coach or whatever you want. Mm. So there's different different threads. Most is based on my experience within a corporations and uh, you know buying grades, selling grades, um, ganging up of people to take them out from the equation and, and stuff like that. There is so much more of this. I mean, it's it's obvious when it happens and it's loud. It's at a big level, right? Mm. That's easy to spot. But there is so much of this that happens subtly. There's yeah, well, so yeah. much of this going on. And I'll, I'll be honest. I knew it happened. I knew it was common. I did not know how common it was until the last few years. As oh, yeah. I've done more of this, more episodes of this <clears throat> show, as I get to meet more and more people, and I hear stories. I hear stories from people they don't even realize that this is what's going on. They're involved in it and they don't see it. And it yeah. blows my mind. It is, but I think it's a human nature because mm -hmm. being involved in, in uh, Olympic wrestling and stuff like that, same pool everywhere to use the nice language. Yeah. Um, and it's more money is involved, it is multiplied. Mm -hmm. I would love to believe that, you know, we're pro all promoting the martial arts make better people. But the truth is that the good instructors make good people. And um, and I don't mean technically good. I mean the good pe good people. And yeah. unfortunately, martial arts are like money. Um, they ampl amplify your um, character. If you've got more money and you're a bad person, you're just a more powerful bad person. Same on the dojo floor. If you've got somebody who likes to abuse the power, that's what happens. The, 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 the grades give them that more power to abuse, unfortunately. But, you know, we all, more people is aware of it. That's the purpose of the book. I give some tips to spot things out. And, you know, more people are aware about it, yeah. the more we can eradicate it. Yep. I don't think so we're going to be... Uh, super successful with it because like I said if there's money to make to be made they're always going to be people um, abusing the power mm -hmm. well th there's there's one there's one thing that gives me hope and that is I, I, I work with a lot of martial artists and I consult with some martial arts schools and one of the things I see is that the schools that are not focused on money but are instead focused on building a quality culture, like you talked about, about being there, supporting their students, providing the best <clears throat> balance they can and investing themselves with their students in an outcome that makes everyone better. The, they actually make more money. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And so if people realize, okay, if I can forget about money to some degree, if I can focus on quality and that ironically makes me more money, it hopefully over time, as people start to realize that, will help people make better decisions. Mm -hmm. There will always be some, you know, I'm sure we're, we're in agreement on that. There's always, it's human nature, as you said. Yeah. Uh, I think that the other, other problem is that, um, at least for me, it was a huge problem, is that um, we've got, we've been taught that mentality of poor sensei, right? Mm. You, you're only a good instructor if you give everything for free. And you not make money on it, so right. there is kind of a stigma for people who are decent to make money on martial arts, right? It took me a long, long time to 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 convince myself and make a peace with myself that I can make a decent living, do what I do the best, instead yeah. of having second, third job just to train in the evening two hours. Can you can you speak to that more? Because I'm sure we have people 
listening. Some of them will say, no, a great martial arts instructor does it all for free. Forget about them. I don't care about those mm. people right now. But for the people who hear you and they say, you know what? I agree, but I'm also struggling with that decision. What would you tell them? What did you tell yourself? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what uh, my friends told me. Ian, I'm enough. You know Ian. I do. I think. Uh, and he said to me that, you know, think, if you have, you've been working eight, ten hours a day, then you go to teach. Can you put 100% of your effort to teaching? No, because you're being tired from work. Mm -hmm. So if I put 100% of my effort to teach, but I don't work, I have no food. I cannot teach because I'd be starving, right? I've got bills to pay everything. So the best way to give a quality martial art is to focus on doing this as your work. I'm not saying stealing money, giving belts away. You provide a service. There's no problem with personal trainers. There's no problem with cooks. There's no problem with uh, wood makers, whatever other profession. It's only in martial arts that you must be a full sensei to do a good job. I like don't really know where that come from, but my that's kind of was narration narration where I was growing up in martial arts, right? The only good teacher is doing it for free for a passion, and you know everybody needs to eat. Everybody's got families. Until you're doing a decent service to people and you support community, you're giving back to community. I don't see a problem. So if you're listening to this or watching this and you've got that problem, think how much your martial arts would be better if you could do it eight hours a day and being paid for it. Yeah. How much your students would benefit? The scenario you're talking about is exactly why I, I had a, a school for a few years uh, a long time ago, and that's why I closed it, because mm. I was tired of going to class and not being able to give my students my best. I knew it wasn't my best. Mm. I'd walk in the door saying, I'm at best 50% today. And I felt like I was robbing them, that, I, that they deserved better. And at the time, I wasn't able to deliver more. Mm. So I you know, closed the school. And I know mm. I'm not alone. Mm. As well, you know, you need to uh, facilitate the time for making a program for teaching. You just mm. cannot go and make it up on a, on a spot. Oh, we're going to do this today, do that today. You need to have a program. So, so you've got that progression and your mm. students are progressing in a nice way instead of jumping and, and you know, nobody does anything correctly. Mm. Where can people find your books? Amazon is the Amazon. easiest way. Uh, we've got uh, some on our uh, website, but due to the Brexit, I don't know how much they cost. Uh, they've done it very nicely. So they use sometimes people getting in parts of Europe book and it costs more in taxes than mm. actually the worth of the book. So I kind of stopped selling abroad uh, from the website because just people don't get in value. Um, so Amazon is the easiest way to, to get okay. it. But everything else, it's on our website. So our um, Facebooks, um, we've got a small podcast, not as uh, well known as yours, but a mini podcast. Uh, it's in the multimedia part of our website and it's um, www.lesbuka.co.uk. Okay, great. And, and tell us more about your podcast. Um, so it's called Anxious Black Belt. When we, uh, uh, I try to get the conversation with people uh, about mental health and how different martial arts getting uh, their benefit them. Uh, sometimes the random stuff, you know, whatever comes to my mind. Uh, sometimes it's just me washing up and talking to the phones or random ramblings. But it, it revolves around the mental health and, and karate. Like I said, it's very small, but if you want to, Try it. I will yeah. welcome all, all the li listens and subscriptions. I, well, I, I, I have said from day one, I don't care what podcast people listen to as long as mm. if, it, if it enhances their experience of martial arts, then they should listen to it, which is why, you know, we so often have other podcast hosts on. We actually have a website 
I don't think yours <clears> is up there. You should fill out the form called martial arts podcast.com. Mm-hmm. So we can promote as many martial arts podcasts as we can, because, you know, a rising tide lifts all ships. I want to support everybody that we can. Cool. I will make sure I fill it up. <laughs> awesome. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. And it's time to wrap. So how do you want to leave it? What are your final words to share with the audience today? My final words would be uh, a quote which I come up with and is kind of a motto for uh, for myself. So if you're a karate student, that applies to you. If you're a karate teacher, it applies to you as well. So uh, the strong and caring people are the pillars of society. And karate helps to... Uh, see, I make it wrong. And karate, okay. seems, karate helps to cultivate them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like Can I say it again? Please, say it again. <laughs> so, uh, strong and caring people are the pillars of society, and karate helps to cu- uh, cultivate them. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the best um, description of what I do. We try to make a strong and caring people. It probably doesn't come as a surprise to any of you that martial arts training can have a benefit on mental health. I was really excited to hear how Les is leaning into that, though. I think that's so great. The idea of classes rooted in that benefit just means a great deal to me. I suspect he's not the only person doing this, but I hope, most importantly, others will take his lead and implement these classes, or maybe adjust how classes are done. Because I think where we are in the world, I think we need that. Les, thanks for coming on. Thanks for doing what you do. I appreciate you spending some time with me. Listeners, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com to find all the relevant, fun, interesting stuff related to this episode and all the others. And if you want to support us, if this episode did something for you and you want to help us out, Think about the Patreon, think about grabbing a book or buying something at whistlekick.com or anything else that seems like it might be beneficial. Interested in having me come to your school for a seminar? Just let me know. Use the code PODCAST15 to get 15% off at whistlekick.com. Email me with topic or guest suggestions. Our social media is at whistlekick and my email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.